If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the Word of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing him. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefront besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. You can complain about the borders all you want, but the fact of the matter is there are millions who are already here. Until the Biden administration sends the global message, which they're not going to do, that our border is not open, we will enforce it, we will deport illegals, they are coming. And so I'm trying to tell you, how do we deal with that? Welcome to Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. We have been dealing with essentially open borders for almost a decade. Um, this isn't a new issue. It's gotten much worse now. We are getting more media coverage on the problem, but it's been going on for years. I was just looking up a piece that I had written in September of 20. 17 for Town Hall titled Why Democrats Want No Walls and Why We Must Build Them. 2017, I wrote that piece. And yet, almost nothing has changed. The situation has gotten far worse. Take a look at this particular graph right here. This is of migrants crossing through the Darien jungle. So this doesn't include those people, not all of these people who go through the Darien Gap end up in the United States. They don't all end up crossing our border. Some of them die. Some of them are eaten by wild animals. Some of them, some of them, not many of them, but some of them turn back. And there are still others who stay in places like Panama and Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico. But many of them do enter the United States. And let's just take a look at this graph. Look at the massive numbers of people who have come in just since Joe Biden has taken office. Well north of 100,000 in um, 2021, over 200,000 in 2022, and according to this, roughly 450,000 in 2023. Now, so those of you who watch this show, the the uh, the posse, you will know that I was just in the Darien Gap. I was at a center front. Um, that's the uh, the Panamanian um, border. Uh, a police, border patrol, border army, uh, if you will, Sena Frontera. Uh, I was at their outpost near the Darien Gap, and their numbers are actually quite higher than this. The ones that aren't published, ones that they have in a in a back office, they show more than 500,000, right at about 520,000. But whatever numbers that you're going with, we see that the problem is infinitely worse than it has been in any other time in our history. And then we have this. Let's look at this recent New York Post headline. Biden administration fails to file paperwork, causes 200,000 migrant deportation cases to be tossed. Serious concerns. So the Biden administration at this point, I think everybody knows that the Biden administration is actively sabotaging not just our borders, but any attempt to deport illegal aliens within the borders of the United States. And now you have, um, just recently, uh, you have Maduro's Venezuela, which is saying we'll no longer take them back. They won't take back Venezuelans, and uh, you can't send them to uh, Cubans back to Cuba. Uh, the, the situation has become untenable. Financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around six rate cuts by the Fed this year. Then the data came out higher than expected. Friends, this isn't going away. Not anytime soon. It simply can't. The U.S. is 34 trillion dollars in the hole, and yet 
we keep printing money, which pushes the prices you pay every day even higher. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. Diversify a portion of your savings into Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation, and Birch Gold Group makes it really easy for you to own. They'll help you to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Text IDEAS to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold. Then talk to a precious metal specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text IDEAS to 989898. We're still hearing a lot of conservative podcasters and politicians and others who are out there railing about the borders. Now, I'm with them on this. Um, we need, as I have said repeatedly, again, going back to at least 2017 with that piece in Town Hall, I have said repeatedly that we must enforce our borders, that we must uh, enforce, we don't need new laws, just existing immigration and border law. But it's not happening. And so what I could do on a show like this, ladies and gentlemen, is get on here and do what it seems that almost everybody else does. And that is just simply whine and complain about the fact that our borders are not being enforced, about our border law, our immigration law is not being enforced, and how illegal aliens are not being deported. I could do that. But I feel like I'm not really doing my job if that's all that I do. There has to be more to this because the situation hasn't changed. And I feel like part of my responsibility is to equip you to deal with what is coming. Um, Ann Coulter, someone whom I admire and I appreciate much of what Ann Coulter uh, has done, what she has written over the years. Her central issue these days, uh, and not just these days, but going back to Trump's presidency, was the border and a border wall. Now, I will tell you a wall, the people that I engaged in South America and Central America a wall isn't going to stop those people. If you're willing to go through the Darien Gap, I dare say a wall is not going to prevent you from coming into the country. But her the central issue for her uh, is that it is illegal aliens entering into this country. To my knowledge, however, in no point has she or anybody else really offered any kind of response to this situation. And so in the previous podcast, what I did was I offered, or I said rather in a thread, and I said as well in, uh, in that particular podcast, that there needed to be a Christian response to the illegal aliens within our border. Now, <laughs> that got a lot of people angry. People who wanted to take what I had to say out of context, who didn't listen to the full context who didn't listen to the podcast itself. But let me just give you some of the responses that I got here. Some of them are actually quite hilarious. I said, look, I'm not talking about the criminal element. I'm not talking about cartels. I am talking about those people who have come and they are, they are a majority of the ones who are coming into the United States from Central and South America. I am not referring to the people who are being flown into the country from Muslim countries. I'm not referring to, to Somalis. I'm not referring to uh, people coming from India and Afghanistan. I'm not talking about those people. I, and, and in part because I can't speak to that issue because I haven't delved into that specific demographic yet. My focus has been south of the border, and it's south of the border where the more majority of them are coming from. And I can tell you that those people, in spite of the things that many people will say, the majority of them are not criminals. Does that mean they should be allowed to come into the country? No, it doesn't mean that. 
But the fact of the matter is they are coming into the country. Now, you and I, we can stamp our feet. We can whine about it. We can complain about it. We can sulk. We can pout. But the fact of the matter is they are coming into the country. And so what I'm trying to say to you is, is there needs to be a thoughtful response to this. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do? So I suggested that we as Christians, I think, we need to begin to engage these people. I mean, I personally don't want to see them become Democrats forever. And the kind of rhetoric that is pouring out from Republicans, from conservatives, and dare I say, from people who at least claim to be Christians, it's the kind of rhetoric that's going to just drive them into the arms of Democrats, who I promise you do not care about these people at all. They're just making cynical use of them. People who annihilate the unborn don't care about the born. People who um, believe that the global population needs to be seriously reduced, they, they don't care about people, and they don't care about their people. But their rhetoric gives the impression that they do. And these illegal aliens who are coming into the country are buying into it. They believe, you know what? Conservatives, Republicans, they hate us. They don't want us here. But Democrats do. So saying that I think that there needs to be a thoughtful response, there were a lot of people who got very angry over this. And I'll, I'll come to these tweets in just a moment. But I had decided, look, being angry solves nothing. It does not change the situation at, at all. So after the last podcast, I spoke with Oh, high government officials who reached out and said, there's no putting this genie back into the bottle because we're talking not about a few hundred or a few hundred thousand. We're talking about millions of people who have entered the country illegally in just the last decade. Again, this isn't a recent problem. This has been an ongoing problem. Democrats first quietly sabotaged all efforts to keep our borders secure, and now they quite openly do it. So we are faced, we are faced with a fait accompli. We are faced with a situation we must deal with. You can, you can complain about the borders all you want, but the fact of the matter is there are millions who are already here. They are already here. You going to shoot them? You're going to deport them personally? Are you going to go down to the border with some of your buddies and load up some guns and go down there and prevent them from entering into the country? Of course, you're not going to do that. And, and by the way, even if, I mean, the Biden administration has zero desire to enforce immigration and border law. They have zero desire to deport hardly anybody. But even if Trump takes office as president of the United States, and I make a distinction between him taking office and being elected as president of the United States. The two no longer necessarily go together as 2020 indicated to us. But even if Trump does take office as president of the United States, I suggest to you that this situation isn't going to change much, not because he wouldn't want to change it or because I wouldn't want to change it or you, but because since Obama, and it has been doubled down under Biden, which is just essentially uh, Obama's third presidential term, government institutions have been weaponized against any conservative candidate taking office. We saw this with the Trump presidency. We saw his own generals uh, committing treason against him, calling China, which is what Milley did. We saw his Department of Justice working against him. We saw ICE not fulfilling their responsibilities. We saw active efforts to destroy border integrity. So even if Trump takes office, I don't see this situation changing much. We'll see fewer um, you know, executive orders facilitating these kinds of things. But the border problem will remain. 
because Democrats have weaponized government against any, not just Trump, any pol uh, a conservative political candidate who takes office. They have also weaponized the courts. They have always sought a judicial oligarchy. They don't respect democracy. They don't want democracy. They want to do an end run on democracy on the office of the president of the United States if he happens to be a conservative because they want to continue to advance their evil agenda. So again, that brings me to a place where I'm thinking to myself, I can tell you what you want to hear. I can, I can come on a podcast like this and I can tell you we we need to secure our borders, which we do need to secure our borders. We, we need border integrity. We need to enforce the law. I can say that till I'm blue in the face, but the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, it's not happening. It isn't happening. So that led me to, to the conclusion while I was in South America that there needs to be another plan until such time, if ever, our borders are secured and deportations take place. And I say, if ever, there needs to be another plan, especially for those illegal aliens who are here, who are already here, and they number in the millions. They number in the millions. There needs to be another plan. So speaking to this staff of conservative government entities telling me, which I would have said to them if they hadn't said to me, that there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Larry, what is your recommendation? What would your recommendation be? And my recommendation is this. And I said this in the previous podcast, and I said it on Twitter, and I'll say it here. We need a Christian response to illegal aliens within our borders. We need a Christian response. Now, you need to think of me. If you're not, if you're new to this podcast, the posse knows this. They, they understand this. But for those of you who may not be familiar with my work, think of me as your scout. I'm the guy who rides to the sound of the guns. I ride over the next hill, and then I come back, my horse all lathered up and panting, an arrow through my hat, and I tell you what's coming. Now, sometimes that, that report isn't a cheery report. Sometimes what I'm telling you isn't what you want to hear. But that is what I do. I'm not doing my job if I just tickle your ears. And I'm trying to prepare you, ladies and gentlemen, for what is coming. And we're going to do that more in, I've been thinking about an episode that I want to do that's in effect kind of prepping. <laughs> prepping you quite literally. I mean, right down to things like bottled water and you know um, food reserves. I recommend that you have them. You, you start putting grain in the silo to use a biblical reference. We're going to do a podcast that talks a little bit about that. And those of you who follow me and my work will know that I endeavor to be a rational voice. I'm not reactionary. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm dealing in the realm of realities, harsh realities. And the things that I see in my travels tell me that I am coming back to tell you what you need to get ready for. Prior to World War II, Winston Churchill, who we now think of as a savior of Western civilization, quite rightly, he's one of my heroes. And um, as arguably the greatest statesman of the 20th century, But in his own time, especially in the 1930s, Churchill was not popular. He was thought of to be an old has-been. So, you know, born in, what was it, 1874, by the, uh, by the 1930s, Churchill is out of office. 
He's a backbencher uh, in Parliament. Almost nobody is listening to Churchill. And Churchill began getting intel out of Germany. He had sources in Germany after Hitler assumed office in 1933 who began informing him that Hitler was preparing for war. By the way, a genius movie. It is one of my favorite movies. I watch it for inspiration at least once a year. And it's called The Gathering Storm. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Please watch it. The Gathering Storm with Albert Finney and um, Vanessa Redgrave. Absolutely a fantastic film. Jim Broadbent is also in it. A great film, The Gathering Storm. They made a sequel to it that's not quite as good. And, and to me, it's just simply because Albert Finney wasn't in it. But it's called The Gathering Storm. And it is, it is telling the story of the 1930s, what I am telling you, which is factual. Churchill begins receiving intel, hard intel, that is telling him that Hitler is preparing for war. So he begins giving speeches that are quite specific in Parliament, stating what is going on in Germany. What's with a ball bearings plant? And what's going on that this particular town, its population has doubled within a couple of years? And Churchill jokingly says, are they making later hosen? Sausages? He says, no. They're making Messerschmitts. And no one wants to hear what he has to say. You've heard the whole saying, you may not like the messenger, don't kill the, excuse me, you may not like the message, don't kill the messenger. Ivan the Terrible, quite famously, did not like a message he received and took a pike and put it through the foot of the messenger. Please don't pike me. Do not assume that when I am telling you these things, that that means I'm in favor of them. I'm just simply telling you the realities. And Churchill was telling the British people, the Western world really, we must prepare for war. But nobody wanted to hear that. Not the government of the time, not the British people. He was publishing articles that were being denounced. He was being denounced as a warmonger. No one wanted to believe it, not because it wasn't true, but because they didn't want it to be true. A Churchill contemporary, a man by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge, another hero of mine, said this. This is somewhat of a loose quotation of Muggeridge off the top of my head. He says this. He said, people believe lies, not because they are plausibly told, but because they want to believe them. Now, you can keep your head in the sand as the people of the 1930s did regarding war. They had been warned. When, on September 1st of 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and World War II began, Britain was essentially unarmed. They had virtually no standing army, virtually no armor, virtually no artillery, battleships, you name it. Hence, Lend-Lease. The United States began equipping Britain for war because they were wholly unprepared for it. But again, not because they were not warned, because they were. Churchill had been declaring it in Parliament for years. He had been writing article after article about it. He had been denounced. He had been called names. There had been efforts to do him harm because he was saying what people did not want to hear. The Churchill you know now is the Churchill of mythology. But I'm telling you that at that time, he wasn't thought of that way. We think of him that way now because we look upon history and what was accomplished and what he did, but none of it would have happened if he had not had the courage to tell people the truth, to tell people the truth of what the situation is. Now, again, what did I say? 
Did I say I don't want open borders? Or did I, excuse me, that I want open borders? I did not. Did I say that I didn't want our existing immigration and border laws enforced? I did not. Go back and look at this piece from 2017. I'm arguing for a wall. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate, hate that our borders are not being defended. Not because I hate um, the migrants, but because I believe that a country cannot reasonably exist without borders. I believe there must be a sensible immigration policy. I believe we must vet the people who are coming into the country. I don't know if I said this on the last podcast or not. But not to alarm you further, but when I was on the Panamanian side of the Darien Gap, I am talking to a Senefront outpost commander. And he's showing me the numbers that I just referenced just a moment ago. 520,000 illegals. And when I say illegals, I don't just mean in the United States. These people are illegal in every country they pass through except their country of origin. Because none of these countries want them. And he tells me that they've done biometrics on all 520,000 of these people. And then he says, and by the way, I like this guy. He was very nice. He was very helpful. And then he says that, um, you know, at least you can rest easy because we have weeded out the criminal element in here. Because in doing the biometrics, we then check the biometrics against Interpol to see whether or not they actually have a prison record. Excuse me, a, um, a criminal record. I guess prison record too. And I said, but doesn't that assume that countries, rogue countries like, let's say, China and Cuba and Venezuela are uploading their criminal records to Interpol accurately. And he thought about that for a second and said, you got a point. <laughs> Meaning, they don't know who they're letting through. Just because you checked his biometrics against Interpol doesn't mean he doesn't have a criminal record because I promise you the Venezuelans, if they're giving anything to Interpol, it is an accurate data. They're not doing that. China's not giving accurate data, if any. I don't want those people in our country. However, there are millions of them that are already here. There are millions of illegals who are already here, not, not, not criminals. There are many criminals too, but millions of these migrants who are already in the United States. So what response should there be to that? Well, as I said, <clears throat> there needs to be, pardon me for a second, there needs to be a Christian response. Quite honestly, I mean, if you're a Christian, everything we do ought to be as a Christian response, right? I mean, our view on walls should have some foundation in biblical principles. And there are those people out there who seem to argue that um, there shouldn't be any walls from a biblical point of view. I've seen guys like Russell Moore uh, make nefarious arguments of that nature. Um, Israel was called to be different, <laughs> separate from the nations. You talk about border integrity. They were told to have it. But they were also told on those occasions in their history where such wasn't always possible to show compassion to the sojourner, to the foreigner. But this is what I said. So now here are some of the responses I got from people who went off on me on Twitter. Why would I want to engage them? I don't want to engage them or encourage them or assist them or even help. I want them gone. And I detest these organizations, Christians or non-sectarian, who do assist them. They need to be arrested, detained, and returned from whence they came. 
Karen and Jim. Well, Karen and Jim, they're not being arrested, detained, and returned. So what now? You're living, you're living in fantasy land. From Devonsworth, the bottom line is that our nation does not exist to save the poor of the world. It exists for the security and prosperity of its citizens. Preach the gospels to them. Show them their sin of coveting their neighbor and tell them to sin no more and go home. Devonsworth, again, my point, awesome, great. Have at it. Not going to happen. You're telling me what you want to happen. I'm telling you what is happening. You're talking fantasy. I'm talking reality. Here's another. I hate to be contrary to such a heartfelt post, but these people are intentionally breaking our laws. They are coming here to live free off of welfare, reduce the white population to minority status, and destroy America as we know it. That's Democrats' plans for them. That does not represent what these people are about. It just doesn't. I've engaged hundreds of these people, hundreds of them. I don't think this reflects who they are. Now, I will tell you that's why Democrats want to bring them. But again, so what are you going to do? They're here. They're, they're not being deported. They're not going home. Next one. Mindy Cantu. They're knowingly entering the country illegally. It is dishonest and criminal. If, in fact, they wanted to be American citizens, they should have uh, entered legally through the immigration system. Wonderful. You're not listening to me. They're here, Mindy. They're here. Maybe they should have done this, or they should have done that, or they ought to have done this, or they ought to have done that. But they didn't. And they're here. Rhonda. I like Rhonda. I agree with what Rhonda has to say here. I never dreamed we would see our country invaded in my lifetime. I never dreamed we would have the biggest piece of boop for a president destroying our country from within. Feels like we're closer to the end of time. I agree with that. A woman named Julie, stop burdening consciences. <laughs> How dare I tell you to behave like a Christian? And by the way, why do people automatically assume that when you say that, that means I say, they, they seem to think that means I'm endorsing some kind of milk toast, um, willy nilly passive, mamby-pamby kind of Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear. I believe that it is my Christian responsibility to defend my home and to defend my family with force, if need be. So if you think that what I'm saying here to you is that, that, that you cease to stand for anything, for any principles, that's not what I'm saying. But if you think all these people are entering the country are all criminals, you're just wrong. Again, I've met hundreds of them. I've been in at least six countries where I've been interviewing them over the course of the last five years. Please don't lecture me on who they are. I know far better than you do. And I would want to remind you that Democrats don't care about these people. They don't. They want to use these people. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Bridget Eckerly says, the response is to mass deport them and lock our borders up. Wonderful, Bridget. Do it. Biden's not going to do that. Trump is not going to do that. And you live in fantasy land if you think he is. So again, I'm dealing in realities. I'm telling you your basement is flooding and you are pulling out, going through the drawer and pulling out for me the warranty where the company told you it wouldn't flood. And I'm saying, be that as it may, <laughs> the basement has a foot of water in it. So now what are we going to do? I'm dealing in the realm of realities. You people aren't. 
John Koenig says, easy for you to lecture people when you obviously have plenty of money to support your family and buy expensive cigars. Woo-hoo! But most people are barely getting by. The illegals are being sent here to destroy us. Your sanctimonious sermons are not going to fix the problem. John, you haven't a clue, first of all, as to my own economic status, and secondly, as to what I do, and thirdly, about my cigars. John, I smoke expensive cigars. I do not pay expensive prices for cigars. There is a difference. John is texting me now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not asking you to do anything that I myself have not done or would not do. Some have said to me, open your home to migrants. Have for 20 years and will continue to do so. Not to people who I think are going to come in and rob me and try to do me harm, but those people that I believe I can help and that I've made some judgment about. I can be wrong, but I think I can help. And it's because I believe they have souls. You know, my mission, the great commission, as a Christian, I don't see any caveats on race or their migration status. I don't see that. But John, send me your address. Verify that you are this same person and I'll send you an expensive cigar. Not John, because I paid a lot of money for it, but because I have sources. Holly, this one cracks me up. There are military age, angry, rude, arrogant men. Have you met any? I have. It's easy to argue for something you don't have to actually live with. Get out from behind your damn keyboard. (laughs) Holly, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Holly, I sit here exhausted and sick because I have just returned from seven of the last nine weeks traveling to... I don't, I've forgotten how many countries now, seven or eight countries, where I've been addressing this issue. In some cases, in very dangerous circumstances. How dare you tell me to get out from behind my damn keyboard? I get out from behind it all the time, Holly, and I put my money where my mouth is. I absolutely do. Have I met any? More than you, Holly, I dare say. Have engaged them? You bet I have. Have I put myself in dangerous situations to do so? 100%. And as for your first sentence, there are military age, angry, rude, arrogant men. What a stupid remark is that? Centerfront tells me, and I trust their data because it's not data they're publishing, 75% of the people coming through the Darien Gap are men. That reflects my own experience in Colombia, in Panama, in Mexico, and in other places. Are some of them, and I said this in the previous podcast, are some of them military men who are being sent to the United States to do us harm? Yes. Yes, I'm convinced of this. Are some of them criminal elements? Yes, I am convinced of this. I cannot stop those people coming. The Biden administration is not stopping them from coming. But they are not the majority. There's no way they are the majority of that 75% of men. And that is because most of them are men who are heads of families who are going ahead of their families to find a job and find a place to live and then send back for their families. This is the way traditionally migration is done. My wife's family, um, one of her granddads, he left Germany came to the United States to find land and to begin to establish a homestead and then go back and get the family and bring them over. I understand this. If I'm a man, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm not taking my wife and children through the Daring Gap if I can avoid it. I'm going to try to establish a place for us to live and then go back for them. And it's not just here. When I'm in Colombia, most of the migrants that I interviewed in Colombia in some really shady places were men 
who would tell me that they, you know, they would have their families with me. And when I would say, hey, how long have you been in Colombia? They would say, ah, you know, I left Venezuela about five years ago, but she only got here just three years ago. And I say, well, why is that? Say, because I left Venezuela, I left her at home. I came to Colombia. I found a job with sending money home until I could find a permanent place, place that was big enough for all of us. And then I went back to Venezuela and I brought them over. This is the way this is typically done. Do not assume that every male that is crossing our border is coming here to blow up railroads. Some of them are. Some of them are. One guy even said, Larry, have you gone woke? I wonder if anybody asked Churchill that. War is coming. Winston, have you gone woke? Hitler is building a Wehrmacht to overrun Europe. Winston, have you gone woke? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just simply telling you the truth. I'm telling you that they're coming. And I'm also telling you that what I think is really the real source of this anger. Many of you who were angry with me, and it isn't the posse who got angry with me. These are, these are all fringe elements who just, you know, listened to the first 10 seconds of a video clip or read uh, a descriptive headline for a podcast and decided to sit down and fire off um, these tweets. It's often what unintelligent people do. They don't get context. They just react. Some of them may even be bots, for all I know. But the thing that kept coming to me when I was in South America was this. Came to me in the night after a conversation with a girl, a sweet girl, she's 19 years old. I'd show you a picture of her. Maybe we'll put that up. Smiling. She's left her home in Ecuador. She walked all the way to Mexico City where she boarded, boarded La Bestia. La Bestia is, that's Spanish for the beast. The beast. The beast is the name of that train that you have all seen images of a freight train with thousands of people on the top of it making its way to the United States. That train runs from the border of Guatemala. It's, it's in Mexico, the whole of its route, but it runs the length of Mexico. And it starts around um, the border of Guatemala, goes through Mexico City, and then it moves to the north. And these People board it. They get all over the top of it. It's quite dangerous. La Bestia, the beast. This girl walked to Mexico City. She boarded the beast. She took it north to the border. Doesn't do it in a single day. It takes time to get there. She was arrested by Mexican border patrol, border security. Sent all the way back to the Guatemalan border where she went back to Mexico City, boarded La Bestia, went to the American border, again, Reynosa, where she was arrested by Mexican Border Patrol again four times. Four times. A 19-year-old girl. And she'd been doing this for, I think she said she'd been doing this for four months. It had been taking her that long each time. She had nothing. She didn't have two wooden nickels to rub together. And I'm sitting and talking to people in Colombia and in Panama who are entering the Darien Gap or coming out of the Darien Gap who have, as I have told you, been macheted. One boy is showing me scars all over his arms from the cartels demanding he pay them $150. He didn't have it. 
So he says that while he's on the ground, they hold a gun to his head and fire it next to each ear. And then they whack him in the head. They weren't trying to split his skull, but they were trying to hurt him. Whacked him in the head with a machete, cutting him wide open at his uh, scalp. You know, of course, head wounds bleed horribly and cutting his, his wrists and arms. Talked to a migrant party who saw someone in their group being eaten by a jaguar. Talked to people who saw loads of dead bodies in Daring Gap. Far more people are dying in the Daring Gap than is being reported. And it's because the indigenous peoples and the cartels are hiding the bodies. That's because they want the human trafficking train to keep rolling. If you see dead bodies, maybe you don't keep going. And you know what one fellow who's taking supplies into the Daring Gap said to me, he said, you know, I think a lot of these people are dying of heat exhaustion and um, heart attacks, dehydration. Uh, because he says they're being told not to take enough water. So they're only taking, you know, a couple of bottles of water with them. You're going to drink that within a couple of hours because, you know, the, the water's just, you know, my own hiking in Darien, very briefly, I'm going through, you know, a couple of bottles of water because the water is just pouring out of you. But they're being told, don't carry it, it's too heavy. You'll be able to drink from natural springs. The problem is with the natural springs is that you can get giardia pretty quickly. And if you get dysentery, you get diarrhea while you're on a, um, a days long, week long hike through the Darien Gap, you become seriously dehydrated. You cannot put enough liquid in you to compensate for what is going out of you. And you'll die. He said, some of these other people, what are they doing? Their knees and their ankles and so on are swelling so horribly, but the guides keep pushing them about 10, 12 hours a day of hiking. And we're talking up mountains. Cayman and crocodile-filled rivers. And he said, so what are they doing? They're taking Red Bulls. They're drinking these Red Bulls. And that was called Red Bull, the caffeine drink. He says they're having heart attacks. Girl who's raped by three men, children disappearing. Parties that go through the Darien Gap, the indigenous people will just simply come along and say, we'll take her and her and the little boy. The rest of you move on. One guy told me he saw someone who protested in defense of a woman who was being raped and they turned and shot him in the forehead right there on the spot. We have no records of the people going into the Darien Gap. No one is coming looking for you. There will be no Darien Gap police force. No Columbo is going to investigate your murder. You just disappear, and they know this. The cartels know this. The indigenous peoples know this. So they take whoever they want, do whatever they want. But my point in telling you all that is the central thesis of this podcast. You know what those people didn't do turn back. I said that to you in the last podcast. They didn't turn back. They kept going. This girl went to the U.S. border four times, arrested by the Mexican Border Patrol four times, sent back to Guatemala four times, and she's in Mexico City as I speak, waiting to make her fifth attempt on the U.S. border. So you can whine and stamp your feet and do whatever you want, but until the Biden administration sends the global message, which they're not going to do, that our border is not open, we will enforce it, we will deport illegals, they are coming. And so I'm trying to tell you, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the reality? You're standing there showing me the warranty that says your basement will not flood. And I'm saying to you, be that as it may, it is. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the reality of the situation? Well, I think 
we have to have a proper Christian response. Now, some of you have responded to me by saying, again, not the posse, but some more fringe listeners would say, you know, there are millions of them. What am I supposed to do with millions of them? Well, I haven't said to respond to millions of them, nor have Jesus Christ told you to respond. There are millions of unbelievers, billions of unbelievers in the world, but we still share the gospel. Can you engage the people around you? Not the ones that threaten your life. Not the ones who want to break into your house. By all means, defend yourself. That's Christian too. Defend your family. That's Christian too. Defend your property. That is Christian too. But can you show humanity to those people who have come into our country? who are seeking the American dream. And I was just you south of the border. I'm not referring to the ones who are being flown in. The Muslim element is a different question altogether. And that is because these are people who do not respect our values. They do not want to preserve them. They do not respect our women and they want to destroy it all. That is not true of the people who are coming from south of the border. It just isn't. Again, I've met them. I'm not saying there aren't criminals among them, but that's not, that's not a significant minority of them, and it certainly isn't the majority of them. Most of them are seeking the American dream, and they are fleeing shitholes. Socialist shitholes. Let me tell you an interesting little story. I'm talking to a group of these people in Mexico City who haven't eaten for days. So I take them to buy food for them. They were so humble. We'll show you some video of this. They were so humble. I said, look, bring some guys because we're going to get bottled water and it's heavy. So I need several guys to come with me. So we go a couple of blocks away to a store and it's like a prison. You have bars and they don't let people in. So you have to point through the bars at what you want. And they were, they were so humble. They chose a couple of cans of tuna and some baby formula. And I said, no, 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 let's, let's get every can of tuna they got. Let's ever get every sardine can they've got stuff that will last. Do you guys need, do you need toilet paper? They cheered. I said, let's get the toilet paper. Let's get some Tylenol. You probably need some basic things like that. Some handy wipes, more milk, more baby formula. So we're piling all this stuff up. And, um, and I go to pay for it and they go back to their little tent and they're making sandwiches and they offer me a sandwich. I hate tuna. I hate fish. So I politely declined, but it was awfully gracious of them. And I was moved that they did. And I said, listen, before I go, do you have any questions for me? And they started asking me such naive questions. Does the Rio Grande have crocodiles in it? We've heard that it does. <laughs> and I said, well, take it from me as a guy who swam across the Rio Grande and back, there are no crocodiles in the Rio Grande. And then someone asked a question about the presidential election and they expressed fear that Trump would win. And I said, you know, this is an opportunity for me to explain something to you. And I said, you need to understand that Democrats are not your friends. They thought that was interesting. And I said, not your friends. They're going to pretend like they're your friends. But let me tell you, they're bringing you into the country because they want to use you for their own nefarious political purposes. If they cared about you, do you think they care somebody here was eaten by a jaguar? No. Do you think they care that this girl here was raped? No. They don't care. These people care. These people are haters of humanity. They don't care about you. They said, who does? I said, have faith in the American people. I said, you need to understand that the American people are afraid of you because our media highlights instances of people who are entering the country and are committing rape, kidnapping, fraud, violent crime, you name it. And they all seem very surprised by this. 
And I said, yes, it's true. And they said, well, we've met some of those kind of people in the Darien Gap. And I said, yes. And I said, those people are entering into the country and they give you all a bad name. But I said, you need to understand that the American people are afraid of you. And it's because their own government is using you against them and they resent it. And it is because we are in a global war of elitists against populace, against ordinary people oppressing them. And they said, we understand this. It's why we're leaving our own countries. And I said, well, it's happening in America too. You need to understand this. I said, but I want to tell you, the American people are fundamentally decent and generous people. But if they keep their distance from you, it's because they think you're there to hurt them. They believe you're there to hurt them. Be patient with them. And understand that real churches and real Christians will help you. But you need to understand Democrats are not your friends and you need to obey our laws. And their response to that was very, very positive. This is good intel. You've given us good information, information that we can use because we didn't know this. We didn't know what was happening. I said, yeah, it's, this is all happening. Ladies and gentlemen, your anger spew out your venom, not at me who's just the messenger. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you the truth. Don't spew it out towards these decent people. You can tell me until you're blue in the face how they're violating the law and all this kind of stuff. It's a pointless endeavor. They're coming. And unless you plan to keep them out, they're coming because the Biden administration and no Trump administration is going to prevent them from coming either. They can't because the Justice Department and the Department of Homeland Security have been weaponized against any potential conservative president. And you better believe the Pentagon has been too. So they are coming. Now we have a choice here. You can continue to spew out hate and venom towards them, which will make them Democrats forever. Or you can help educate them about what it means to be an American. You can show them compassion. You can treat them as individuals who have a soul. And before you start lecturing me about the law, and I've stated just in this podcast alone half a dozen times that I'm in favor of enforcing our law. But if you were in the same circumstance as a lot of these people, there'd be no wall that would stop you. I've been in these countries where they're coming from. I've seen them. I've seen what they're dealing with. And as much as you or I might like them to stay in their country, and I believe our government should be doing things to help them stay in their country, it's not happening. And if I were in those circumstances and I thought there was a better opportunity for me in the United States, no wall would stop me. The Darien Gap would not stop me. Wild beasts, cartels would not stop me. I would be coming. That's the truth. Just as in the same way, had I lived in the GDR, East Germany, the law was that you couldn't go to West Germany. If I got a chance to climb that wall, I'm going. I'm gone. So I do understand your hatred should not be poured out towards them, but towards the administration that has opened the borders and has said to them, come on. It's quite understandable that they should do what they are doing. There are fundamental changes that are coming to America. And that is what a lot of you are sensing. And really, that's the thing that is upsetting you, is the knowledge that the world that you have known is coming to an end. And it is. Wish it weren't true, but it is true. I would encourage you to go and read. It's not long. It's a play by Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the Russian writer of the late 19th, early 20th century. He wrote a play called The Cherry Orchard. We're living through the cherry orchard. And if I were to summarize, give you the Cliff Notes version of the cherry orchard, it goes like this. 
there's this aristocratic family that has an estate. And a businessman they know tells them, change is coming. You're going to lose this estate. But you could keep it. But it's going to require some huge changes. You're going to have to cut down the beautiful cherry orchard and sell the wood. And you're going to have to convert some of the land into little vacation cottages. And with the proceeds from the sale of the the lumber from the cherry orchard and the proceeds from the little cottage, vacation cottages, you could keep the rest of the estate. But you need to understand that massive changes are coming. Well, they refuse to listen. They say, ah, but we love the cherry orchard. Don't want that to change. And we can't, we don't want vacation homes here. We're not, we're not going to do that. And he says, I understand that you have sentimental reasons why you don't want change. I get it, but what I'm telling you is, is that change is coming. And this is your only hope. The play ends with the family being booted off the estate. Someone else now owns it. They own nothing. And it was because they refused to change. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in the cherry orchard. You're on that estate, massive convulsive societal change is coming. Now, you can put your fingers in your ears, cover your mouth, cover your eyes, pretend that none of it is happening, or you can prepare as a Christian ought. And I'm saying to you that, yes, we press our politicians for border enforcement, proper immigration law. We call for it. We press for it. We vote for it. But if that's the whole of your strategy, it's woefully insufficient because millions of those people are already here and there will be millions more before anything is done. And they're coming to your neighborhoods, to your towns. They're coming to your churches. They're coming to your organizations to your businesses. And if you are not ready, you will be driven off the cherry orchard. That's the reality. Be angry with me for telling you that if you want. But that is the reality. We are in a battle for civilization. And wouldn't it be wonderful if all of these illegal aliens in our country who Democrats intended for evil the Lord used for good. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful if a great awakening and revival were to take place in this land because Christians took seriously their responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission, not, not just when times were good, but when times are bad. When, when, and when times are bad, I look to Scripture for models and you know, one that keeps coming to my mind is Daniel. His home country was overrun. He was sent into exile. But he remained steadfast in his obedience to the Lord. And the Lord honored Daniel and his friends. He didn't just say, it's an illegal war. It's an illegal invasion. I shouldn't be arrested. I shouldn't be exiled. Why am I here? Daniel dealt with the reality of his situation, and he was faithful to God, and he looked to God for guidance and for wisdom. And it is to the Lord that I point you. This is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, for your metal to be proven, for your worth as a Christian to be proved. I'm reminded of a quotation attributed to Luther doesn't matter who actually said it because it's great one way or the other. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the Word of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Him. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved." And to be steady on all the battlefront besides 
is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Another little literary reference, Don Quixote, tilting at windmills. The church these days, by and large, is tilting at windmills, non-issues, railing about social justice. I hope your church is preparing for this. This is where the battle is raging, on the immigration front, on our borders, on the borders of your neighborhoods. Are you ready? Do you have a plan? The best time, ladies and gentlemen, to develop a plan is not in the midst of crisis, but before one hits. Consider this a warning. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.